okay? They are massively, massively hard and challenging for the last cycle. Because it's formative only, in other words, there can be no one whinging saying, oh, I didn't get enough marks for this, or I didn't do this. I'm going to make it really, really hard. I'm going to push you to the limit in terms of your knowledge and, and, and experience and expertise on this last assignment. Okay? The main tasks are tough. The extension tasks are really tough. But you'll come out of this scarred, bruised, but basically able to walk into any job involving the cloud and know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. So this is more than 99.9% .9 of uh, university graduates. So it's kind of like this sort of Royal Marines uh, boot camp. The survival rate is pretty low, but if you do survive, you, you, know, you come up with a massive amount of skill. Today's session is advanced Git, because I've tried to fit Git into one session and it wasn't going to fit. It actually should be intermediate Git, really, because I'll talk about the advanced topics at the end. But I just thought to cheer you up, I call it the advanced Git stuff. Um, advanced Git. We're going to look at some really, the first session was really getting Git working and making sure everything works, doing pulls and pushes and commits. Um, now we're going to talk about the really exciting stuff, the stuff that makes Git tick under the surface. We're going to look at branches. Uh, we're going to look at merges, which do kind of go together. We'll look at diffs. We'll look at stashing and ignore files. Now, you've kind of, if you've used GitHub, for instance, you've probably come across branches, ignore files and diffs. But I'm going to kind of put things in context. If you understand it for Git, you will understand it for GitHub, because GitHub is basically a flavour of Git. OK, branches. You can't do CVS work, you can't do versioning work without understanding branches. They're so fundamental to the way we work. Um, the idea is you launch separate lines of development in the same project. So just like a branch line on the railway, where you move this, you move the, uh, they move the sort of uh, lever across, and the train goes down a different route. You can have multiple routes in the same project. So let's imagine you get to a point where you're both working on the project, but you've got different ideas. You can create a branch, and you can go down different branches and develop your own versions of the project. Merging is taking two branches and bringing them back together again, and we'll talk about that as well. You can do that. So if you both got cool ideas, you can actually merge it all back together into one big project. And the idea is you should use branches all the time. It's so important, so fundamental, and we'll explain why in a moment. OK, classic use for a branch is let's imagine you've got a stable release you want the customers to use. You simply create a branch and, that, and then continue your, your normal branch development. And that side branch, that little side in, contains a frozen copy of the code at that moment. So they're your stable versions are branches on the system. You've seen this, haven't you, on, on GitHub and other systems like version 0.01 and so on. So the idea is you want a stable release that doesn't want to change. You simply branch off and then just continue on the main, the main route, on the main, the main branch. And that branch will, will keep a record of what the project was at that stage. Beta versions. You're working on a nice stable branch, working on your project, and you've got some really cool ideas for some radical new features for your project. Rather than contaminate the main branch and potentially kill it or, 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 or break it, you, you branch off and you can do all this sort of cutting edge, bleeding edge ideas on a separate branch without affecting the main development. And then if your ideas do work, you can simply merge that branch back into the main branch and all those features are now part of the main release. Research into a bug. How many times have you got one little bug in your code and by fixing the bug you manage to break other things? Done this, you? you get so into the bug, digging into the bug, trying to figure out what's going on. By the time you fix the bug, you've broken three other things in the project. You can create a branch just to fix the bug. And that way you can fix the bug in isolation without damaging the rest of the project. If it doesn't work, you simply backtrack and create another branch. If it does work, you merge your correct version back into the main, into the main uh, branch. So the contributors, this is how Linux uses branches. If you've got different groups, teams of people, or different people working on different parts of the project, you all branch off, you work on your bits, and then you pull the branches together. So you're not, you haven't constantly got to push and pull all the time as you're working on your branch. So you create your branch locally, work on it, and then you push the branch back to the server. And really important, you can rewind to any point on any branch. So if you go down a branch and get stuck, you simply reverse back to the stable part, 
and then carry on another branch or the main or the main branch. So as you can see, branches fix a lot of the issues that you have as software developers. A lot of those really annoying things that you wish you'd known about before. And that's what branches fix. Now, every branch has to have a name. You can't create a branch without giving it a name, but you've got to be sensible. There are very few limits to names. Names follow the same rules as most variables. You can't have spaces, you can't have character, you know, symbols at the start. Generally, it's pretty flexible though. Decide on the naming format before you start making branches. So, for example, if it's a bug, that's a good system. Bug, so you know it's a bug, forward slash Unix path name, and then problem seven. Yeah? So if you've got lots of issues flagged up in your system and the issues are numbered, you can link your branches to the issue numbers. So you can, you can link the two together. Um, yeah, problem report seven, look, so there's my bug flagged as problem report seven. So I can map that, map that branch back to my issues list and I can see how it fits together. Um, you know this master, you, you push back, back to master, don't you, all the time? When you, when you pushes, master is simply the name of the first branch that's provided. When you, when you create a Git repository, you're given a branch called master. You can rename that branch to anything you want. You can even change it to something else and change a different branch to master. That's simply a convention that says, this is the master development branch. Okay, so you can call it anything you want. Now, this concept of active branch, You've got loads of branches, but you can only, only work on one branch at a time. That makes sense, doesn't it? You can't work on multiple branches. I'll show you later with stashes how you can do some work on one branch, switch to another branch and do some work somewhere else without committing. And you can switch backwards and forwards, but at any one time, you can only have a single active branch. And the active branch is the one you're currently working on, the one that's currently in your uh, file system, in your, your, your repository. Okay? And this determines the files that are checked out. So if you switch branches, if you then look at your files in your Git repository, they'll change. Think about it, if you're working on a branch with some new files and you switch to another branch, it looks as if those files have vanished from your file system. Because what gets done, it's deleted those files and reconstruct, reconstructed the files from the branch you want to follow. So the, the files will change and it's quite disconcerting the first few times you do this. Because in a snap, your files have changed. The different versions of the files, different file names, there's files have magically appeared, files magically disappeared. You get used to it. Now, the active branch is often implicit. You know the git push that we did? Yeah, when we git push origin master, remember that one? Technically, all you have to say is git push. Because implicit, the implicit consumption is that you're pushing the, the active branch and you're pushing it to the matching active branch on the master repository. So git push on its own will do the same thing. That makes sense. So, and when you do a git diff, as we'll talk about later, if you don't specify which branch, it assumes it's the active branch. So it's a very important concept to understand. Now, this is, this is something which you don't think about until you do the work. When you name a branch, what are you actually naming? If you create a branch and then create some commits on that branch, and then you load the branch, where are you loading? Which commit are you loading from? Just think about it for a minute. If you want to switch to another branch, you want the latest version of the branch, don't you? With all the commits in. So in other words, the, the branch name is actually a pointer and it simply points to the last commit of that branch. Does that make sense? It's always the end of the branch it points to. So if someone else pushes some more commits onto the end of the branch, then the pointer moves with it. So whenever you pull a branch or switch branches, you're always pulling the latest version of the code. Does that make making sense? You, you, it's always the last bit. It's always the latest, latest commit. Now, when you create a branch, a new branch, you would think you create a branch and everyone can see it. It's not true. By creating a branch, you're simply creating a special commit. And as you know from last week, until you push your commits to the master repository, no one else can see them. 
So a branch is simply a special commit. That's all it is. It works in exactly the same way. So you create a branch, then you have to push that branch back to the master server, to the to the to the uh, to the to the, the, the main server. Okay. Now this is another thing which catches people out. Remember, I said you can create branches to freeze the code, and then carry on with the with the, with the original branch. When you create a new branch, the default action is you don't move to the branch. You stay in the branch you're in to start with. And that makes it very easy to create releases, doesn't it? You simply create a branch, with a, give it a name, release 1.0, and then carry on developing your project. If you want to switch to the new branch, you have to create the branch, and then you have to switch to it afterwards. There is a shortcut which I'll show you a bit later on to create a branch and switch at the same time. But fundamentally, it's a two-step process you have to go through to get to switch to that new branch. Now, clean and dirty systems. Another, another really important uh, version is a concept. A clean system is a system where there are no further changes to commit. In other words, you go to git status and it says nothing left. There's nothing to commit. There's nothing staged ready for pushing to the server. It's completely clean. A dirty repository is one where you've made changes to the files, but you haven't committed and pushed those changes. Do you understand? You can't switch branches if you have a dirty repository. It won't let you. It'll come back with an error. So you've got to make sure you push any changes on the current version you're working on before you start. So I'll correct myself there. You have to commit any changes from the current version before you switch branches. You don't have to push them. You have to commit them to your local clone before you can switch branches. Okay, do you understand that? So you've, you've committed to the local repository, you can then switch and check out a different branch. Now, when you check out a different branch, this is the weird bit. Suddenly, a lot of things change visually. Even though nothing's changed in the repository, your files and directories will be different. If the branch is switched to has three more directories inside it, you will suddenly have three folders appear in your repository from nowhere. And any work you've been working on will disappear. Okay? It's very weird, very disconcerting. And also, if you start looking at histories, you've suddenly got all the branch history going right back to the beginning of the new branch. Now, remember that .git folder I told you about, the hidden one that's hidden inside your local repository? That contains all versions all histories of every single branch. It's just in your, because you're now in the active directory, any commands now apply to this new active, uh, active branch rather. Right, so here's the key commands and I'll show you an example in a minute. Create a new branch, git branch and then give it a name. Easy, isn't it? If you want to list all the branches that are available in your local repository, git branch will list them all. And there'll be an asterisk against the, your active, direct, active, repository, active uh, branch. So there's one that'll have an asterisk next to it, and that's the one you're currently in. If you want more details of the active branch, git show branch shows you all the commits that have been made on your active branch. And this is, if you want to check out a branch, git check out and the name. If you put a B there, it builds the branch. So remember I said there was a way of actually creating a branch and switching and switching to the branch at the same time that b flag is how you create and switch at the same time so let's have a quick look at this so git branch bug pr07 no response it's just created a, a branch at that point git branch and you can see now look i've got the master branch with the asterisk that's where i'm currently am that's my active branch and there's my bug branch, which I've created. It's there, sitting there, waiting to be used. Git show branch, this shows the structure of the branches. Now, they've either got an asterisk against them or an exclamation mark. And this shows the last commit for every single branch in your local repository. So as you can see, because I've only just created a new branch, they both show the same commit. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because they both, they both show the same file contents. 
And down here, you've got these funny symbols all over the place. A bug PR7 modifies readme. That basically says, I'll explain that in a minute, that explains what commit are in which branch. So this is the individual, the last commit, and this shows you the, the, which commits relate to which branch. And then I go to git checkout, and there's my branch name, switch to branch, and of course, in my example, no files will change, will they? Because I haven't made any changes to my main branch before I switched. Right, showing the branch, right. So there's my, the active branch, there's the, uh, the branches, and there's the active branch. Below it shows which commit and which branch. So this is, it's a matrix. It's a two-dimensional matrix going on here. Okay, and it says commit present, and it's on the active branch. Make sense? Plus asterisk, commit is present, it's on the active branch. If it's a merge commit, in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a commit caused by merging two branches, I get a little minus sign as well. So I kind of see what's going on with my, uh, with my branches. Okay. Once you've modified the branch, so I've, 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 I've uh, switched branches to uh, bug PR07, I fix bugs, I commit my changes like I would normally. What I've now got to do is push the changes back to the master repository. That makes sense, doesn't it? I've made my changes locally. Until now, the master repository doesn't even know about this branch. It's a private branch, only I know about it. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Git add, there's my file I've modified. Git commit, bug PR7 fixed. And that's committed that change to my local repository under that branch. Now look how this has changed. Origin is always my active repository. I'm not pushing the origin master, am I, anymore? Because I'm not pushing to the master repository. If I tried to do push origin master, it would say no change, it would say no changes, no changes pushed. Because none of the changes are part of the master repository. Now, if I'd made some changes to the master, committed some changes to master before I switched over to the uh, to PR7, and I'd pushed master, it would have pushed my commits I'd made to the master before I switched. Does that make sense? This push is simply pushing changes from my local repository to the local commits to the, to the global. So, I, so if I just put git push on its own, it would look for any commits I've made to any branches and push them all. That makes sense. This is localised in my pushes to the bug PR7 branch. But by omitting the characters, omitting the, 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 um, the parameters, I can tell it to push all changes. So I could work on three or four different branches in my local repository, commit changes to those local branches, and then git push will just push the whole lot to the server in one go. I don't recommend you do that. that could, you could really upset your co-workers on that one, committing to four or five branches at the same time, especially when you get clashes and conflicts. And as you can see, when I've done blah, 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 push, you can see, look, Asterix, new branch, bug PR7, it's been pushed to the new local, so the new local branch has been pushed to a new global branch. At that point, if any of your co-workers do a git pull, they will get access to your branch and it'll appear in their, their list of branches. So it's all down to the understanding of what's a local branch and what's a local repository and what's a global repository? What's the clone and what's the master? Remember, only push can send changes to the master repository. Everything else happens locally. Now, so do you understand the idea of, of branches and how important they are? And I was biting my tongue over the last week or so, watching you working with GitHub on various projects in Git, thinking I really need to show you this, but I don't want to confuse you just yet. Because a lot of the problems you've been having with GitHub, for instance, if you'd known about branches, you could have actually resolved those a lot quicker. Is that right? Is that a fair, fair, thing, fair comment? And I was biting my tongue watching you guys struggling with this, thinking I don't want to confuse you any more than I have already. But now you know about branches. Branches are cool. Guys have used branches before? Yeah. The experts, the four Macmen of the apocalypse. 
Where, where are the laptops? You, read, you, you, intimid you intimidate Union, don't you, with those? You sit there in his, in his labs, and there's just four laps, four Macs lined up. It just winds him up completely. Okay, merges are the next cool feature. A merge is a way of combining two branches. So branches where you split your development and you work separately, and merges where you pull them back together again into a single branch. Uh, it's really cool. <coughs> Basically, the important thing is you can't merge two branches from different repositories. For this to work, both branches have to be in your local, in your cloned repository for this to work. In other words, when you go type in git branch, it should come up with all the branches you want to merge in that list. Okay, that's the first thing. Now, if there's two options here. Either there are no conflicts, in which case it, Git will just happily merge them and carry on, or both versions have modified the same lines of the same file. That's the point where Git gives up and says, fix it. Okay, so if, as long as you've modified different parts of the file before you merge them, or different files, it will happily merge them and carry on, and you can carry on with a single branch. If you both modify the same lines of the same file, it will flag this up and then it will tell you what lines are conflicting. And you literally go into your code editor and decide which ones you want to keep and then commit. So, merge process. Now, you merge into your target branch. That's important. So, you've got to make sure that you're in your target branch, the one you want to keep, before you merge. That's the one that will remain. Okay, so you make sure you've checked out your target branch. So in my case, that'll be master. I want to keep the master branch. I've got to make sure my branch is not in a dirty state. I've got to make sure there's no uncommitted changes. If there are uncommitted changes, it won't let me merge. Now, use git status. That's good. Remember git status. If there's any changes to your files, git status will tell you what they are. If git status comes up with no changes to be committed, you're fine. If it comes up with changes, you've got to make sure you commit those changes first. And then you merge the second branch into the target branch. And there's a really cool thing called a commit graph, which I'll show you later, which shows you graphically, even on a shell, a shell screen, of what the, what's happened in the, uh, with the branch and the merging. But here we are. Git checkout master. So I've switched to my master branch. Git status, nothing to commit, working directory clean. Okay, that's good. It means I'm ready to start merging my branch. I do git branch to make sure I can see all the branches I want to work on, and I can look, master and bug PR7. Git merge bug PR7. That's it, it's done. Now, updating blah, blah, blah. This word here, I put in red, really important fast forward. If you're doing little bug fixes, you often you'll, you'll take the master branch, you'll fork off, nothing will happen on the master branch, and then you'll merge. And you end up with these little humps all over the place. Well, if you think about it, it's pointless, isn't it? You might as well just flatten it down and not have the hump. If you haven't changed your master branch since you did the old changes, effectively you've, you've changed the master branch, haven't you? So a fast forward commit basically means it flattens it and it won't show a branch. It just merges all those little changes into the gap that you've forked from. Okay, you can override it, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But when you look at it, you'll see, you look at your history, you'll see, oh, where's the branch gone? There is no branch. Because logically, there isn't a branch, is there? You've simply forked off, made changes, and then gone back into the same branch with no changes, to, there's no conflicts, there's no merge. Um, now, I'm going to show you how to override that behaviour, because to show you how the branching works, I wanted to do something very quick. So the idea is simple branches are absorbed into the main branch without any, without any, branch, without any branches showing in the, in the history. But sometimes you want to see it. I can't show you without, show, without, without seeing the branch. So we put a little flag on the git merge command. No fast forward. So now look git merge, if I repeat the same operation, git merge 
no FF, bug PR9, can you see how it's changed? That line is now different. It says merge made by recursive strategy, which is a standard way of merging two branches. Okay? And now I do git status, and my branch is ahead of origin master by two commits. Because what I did in this example is I forked, I did two commits on my bug branch, and I merged back in again. So now it's telling me that I'm actually two commits ahead of the master branch, which is right, isn't it? I've branched, I've done two extra commits, and there's nothing in the master branch, and I've merged back in again. And there's my graph. Now, can you see, even without any graphics, it's quite clear, isn't it? There's bug PR7 fix, and you see that one there. There's my bug fix. And can you see there's no branch created because it did the, did the, uh, the, 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 the fast-forward merge? But bug, bug 9, I did no fast-forward, didn't I? So as you can see, I forked out there. There's my first commit, and when I merge back in, that's my second commit. Remember I said... Branching and commits, branching and merging are commits. So you can see, look, blah, blah, blah. So there's my history. I did a readme file, modified, bug PR7 fix, extra function added to PR8 fix. There's another bug fix, look. And then there's bug 9, attempted fix. I've got a second branch coming off. And there's my merge fixed. And these short codes are my commit codes. So if I want to compare two different versions when I use the git diff command, those are the codes I use to identify the different branches. We're going to talk about tagging branches, but this is the, uh, this is the simple way of identifying branches. Oh, very quickly, graph means show the graph at the side, so, so show the commit graph. Pretty one line means every commit is one line long. If I then say one line, each commit will be multiple lines, it'll look very messy. And a brev commit means show the abbreviated commit codes, the seven digit ones. The full ones are 40 characters long. So the abbreviated ones are seven characters long, and it's easier to see. Merge conflict. If both branches modify the same line of code, you're going to get conflict. It will not merge the code. It will not create a new commit. It will simply give you a warning message and say there's a, there's a conflict. Okay, changes are marked as unmerged. Okay, so they're not merged in yet. You've got to do something yourself. And you've got to resolve it yourself. You've got to open the code editor and decide which bits you want to keep. And once you've resolved it, you, um, you push the commit yourself. So here's an example, look. I've very carefully committed, I've, 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 I've created two clones from the same repository and I've modified the same line, line on both. The first one I merged back in, the first commit I did was fine. When I try and commit the second one, git push, I push the second commit, rejected, master, master. First it says fetch first, because if I've made changes, it means I'm not working on the latest version of the code, isn't it? So I've got to fetch the changes the other person made first, think about it. Then I've got to resolve the conflict. And it even says, blah, 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 remote, the remote contains work that you do not have locally. That makes sense, doesn't it? If I had it locally, I, I wouldn't have made the, uh, I wouldn't have had the conflict. You should have got another repository pushing the, uh, the same ref. You may want to first merge remote changes. Yes, we'll do that. We need to git pull, so we've got a copy of the changes they made. We need to know what they've done, don't we? So we know what to, what to, what to, cho what to choose. Okay, uh, fast forwards, we've talked about that. So I git pull, I pull blah, 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 and now my conflicts are in my local cloned repository. Both, com both conflicts are now local, so I can see them. And we're going to have something called a conflict marker. It's going to go into your source code, and it's going to mark up where the conflict is in your code. It's going to add text to your source code. Okay, then you're going to open the code in your code editor and you will see where the conflicts are. So you resolve your conflicts in Komodo Edit or Brackets or, uh, or any of the other editors you want to use, Sublime or anything you want. So for example, um, you investigate the issues, git diff is useful, git diff basically flags up what the differences are between the files, so you can see where the lines are. 
you locate the conflict markers and they're pretty obvious to spot. They're really, uh, they're really clear. Edit the files, remove the markers. If you forget to remove the markers, the markers become part of the commit because it's just text in your file. So you must make sure any markers get deleted. Otherwise, you'll end up with markers as part of your, 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 your commit. Commit the changes, check the branch. So you can use git diff, but here you are. And can you see, I've done git diff now on my, uh, on my issue, and I can see, look, there's the, the start of my conflict marker, there's the end of my conflict marker, and there's the commit that caused it. And as you can see, look, I've added the first, the second clone file has added four lines, which is where what's caused the conflict, because the first clone had already added those three lines to the same block. So basically, that was there originally. That's what I had to pull back, and that's the commit that it formed part of. I've tried to add these four lines, but they've conflicted. I'm changing the same lines of code. So there's Sublime, and you can see, look, just showing you the whole file. There's the readme.md. This is fine. This bit's fine. There is the start of the conflict, and there's the end of the conflict. You see, it's flagged up in my code. All I've got to do is sort this bit out and then remove the conflict markers. So example, what I might do, there, I fixed it. I've deleted the conflict markers, I've decided which bits I want to keep, there's a bit from each of the files, I've merged it all together, I've made a nice job of it, and that's now fixed. So I can now commit that. I can add the file, I can check the status, I can commit, commit, say conflict resolved, and push. You see, I'm using the abbreviated uh, push command here. I don't need to use the whole thing. I know what I'm working on, it's everything. So I just push all the changes. So can you see how conflicts work and how you resolve them? It's quite straightforward as long as you follow a few simple rules and understand what's going on. And the end result, look, can you see, look, look at this, look how, look how weird it goes. Because what actually happened was the commit, the original commit happened down here. So I've had to merge a commit that happened a long time ago. I've made some changes and it's merged back to a single branch. So it's, 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 it's convoluted now because of the, because of the conflict. Extra stuff in there. Look, there's the PR7. Look, there's the, the PR9 fix. Look, you see there? It merged back in here, which is what we expected, isn't it? But then I, I forked at the bug9 fix to my second branch made different changes to the second branch. I made those two changes to the first branch. I made that change to the second branch and then I merged them back in again. So visually you can see using the graph exactly what's gone on and what's happened. And you can also see now that I only have one branch. So if I go to git branch, I should only see one entry come up, which is the master. So it looks complicated and if you use GitHub, it's a lot prettier. Okay, you get pretty colors and things. But that's fundamentally what's going on. Diffs, just a quick time check on there. <coughs> We're good. Diffs, really quick, is a summary of the difference between two different files. That's all it does. Unix has a diff command as well. Git has a diff command. It compares two files or two versions of the same file line by line to identify any differences between them. Now, if you ever use Xcode, you had the normal editor, the assistant editor. Remember that second button? The third button was the diff. So Xcode and um, Android Studio both have diff tools built into them. Another way to think about this, if, you're, if you can see the differences between two files, you can take the first file, apply the differences, and get the second version of the file. So that, that probably clarifies things a bit more. It shows you how, how Git is, is mapping the differences between files. So here's my first, first version of the file. Here's my diff. If I take the first version plus the diff, I've got the second version of the, of the file. Okay, it's the formal description. Simple way is to use git diff. And all this does, it flags up any differences between your working directory, in other words, where you're working on your files, and your local clone, the, uh, the index. So it flags up any changes you've made that haven't been committed. And most of the time, that's what you do, isn't it? You, you do some code, git diff. Oh, I've changed this file, this file, and this file, and this is what I've added. 
Because then when you do your commit, you can make a comment, can't you, about what the commit's about, what you've changed. Okay? Good to expose what's dirty. If git diff comes back with nothing, it means your working directory is clean. There's no uncommitted changes. And if it doesn't, if it comes back dirty, so there's uncommitted changes, you want to make sure you've staged and committed these things before you carry on. So git diff is a nice little utility command, which is which you'll use all the time. This is cool. If you put a commit name, one of those seven character names in as a parameter, it will compare your working directory to whatever version of the whatever commit you've mentioned. So you can compare your working directory to one that was done two months ago or last week or in a different branch. So you can see all the changes that have been made. On the third one is if you put two commit names, you can put dot dot in the middle there if you want to. It'll show you the differences between two, between two different commits. So you put the two commits in and it shows you what the changes are between them. So again, really useful command. Um, stashing. Right, this is where we get towards the more esoteric commands. This is one of those commands where you won't need it until you need it. You may never use this command, but you may get to a situation where you really need to know about it. Okay, git stashing. Now, it captures work in progress. What it does, you know when you make changes and you commit the changes, don't you, to, the, uh, to your local repository? What happens if you've made some changes but you're not ready to commit those changes? So let's imagine you're working on a, on a, on a branch and you need to very quickly fix a bug in a different branch. That's a classic example. You, you, the code you're working on isn't working. You don't want to lose all those changes, but you don't want to commit them because it's going to, it's going to affect the branch. What you can do is you can stash them. It's a, it's a stack. You take the changes you've made and you push them onto a stack. And that cleans up your working directory, which means you can switch branches, fix the bug, deal with the issue, switch back and pop the stash. And that pops all your changes back into your working directory. Okay, that's pretty cool. You see what I mean? If you need to use it, you'll need to use it. Okay, so if you're in the middle of editing, you fix an issue in the branch, another use is you can pull code into a dirty directory now. Think about this, if you can pop changes off at any point, you've got a way of moving code between branches. You can do some code, you can push it onto the, uh, onto the uh, stash, you can open another branch and you can pop the changes into whatever code you're working on. So you can start to move code between branches. Let's imagine you're working on a branch and you want to make some changes to a different branch. You can get the changes in your working, your dirty, dirty uh, working directory, stash them, switch directories, pop, and your changes are now applied to the different, to the different, different, uh, the different branch. <coughs> and there we are. You git stash save. This message is optional, but I would always put it in because you need to be able to see the different stashes. You need to know which one's which. So I'd always put a message on there, git stash save, git stash pop, pops the top one off the stack. You have no control over which ones you pop off. The only way to get to one lower down is to pop the changes off, <clears throat> remove the changes from your local copy, so you, you, can, you, can, you can remove them and then pop the next one off. So you need to, you need to keep a track of, of what you've popped. And that's where git stash, git stash pop gives you a list of all, gives you a whole list of the, um, the stack. And if you put sensible names against each of your, your, uh, your, pop, your pushes, you'll know what your, what your stack contains. Um, so, so git stash pop pops it off, git show branch stash, gives you a list of all the stash. The one at the top is the one you're going to be popping off next, and the one at the bottom is the last one in the stack. So like a standard, you know, 220, uh, you know, uh, 210 com stash, uh, stack. Does that make sense? So you may never use it, but at least you know about it now. So you can, uh, you, you, you know what, your, uh, what tools you've got available. Ignore files, this is really simple. 
There are certain files and folders you do not want part of your repository. If you're working in doing Xcode, then your binary files, you know when you compile and create binary files, you don't really want that to part of the repository, do you? Because that's just, that's just for you to test. If you're working in, um, have an example, let's say you're working on a Python code, the Google App Engine, any stuff to do with the data store you don't want in the repository. You can exclude certain folders and files from your repository. So here's an example. This is the one I use for my Node.js. I've just copied and pasted from an existing project. So any so so it, there's a folder called Node Modules, which are where I store my uh, the sort of plugins. Now I don't want to put the plugins as part of the repository because the plugins have belonged to somebody else, and anyone can install plugins. It's really easy. So I simply say ignore that directory. <coughs> I don't want that directory as part of the part of the. Um, part of the repository. So if I make any changes to this, it will completely ignore them and I do my, my uh, commit. If I want certain file extensions, I'll just shove this in because I'm not using it as part of this one. Let's imagine I don't want any class files. If I'm working in Java, I don't want my compiled classes. Or I'm working in doing a Windows application, I don't want my exe file. I can say anything ending in .class or .exe, ignore. And that's what the git ignore file is. It simply allows you to exclude certain files and folders and patterns from your repository and it supports regular expressions as well so you can have complicated file structures which you don't want to include in and it will cope with those <coughs> okay commit names okay I've, I've seemed to jump to a section without a heading in there but I'll uh, we'll, we'll go with it now remember I talked about long names and short names didn't I for the slash for the uh, for the commits that's a commit name that is the file, that's the SHA1 hash. That is how Git stores your file. An SHA1 hash is unique code, and from that code, I can reconstitute the file. So a big complicated code, a block of code, a whole file, a class file, a Java file, a, a Python file, a PHP file, can be reduced to a single string like that, using SHA1. That's how it keeps copies of every single version of every file you've created without using loads of disk space. If two, if two files, if the hash is identical, the file's identical. But it also uses these hashes to flag commits, to label commits. And that hash describes all the changes that you've made in that commit as an encoded string. But fortunately, they're not the easiest things to remember, are they? Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that commit, that was last week. Not easy things to remember. So what we can do, we can use short codes, which is basically the first seven digits. Within the local repository, the first seven digits are guaranteed unique. Across every Git repository in the world, that long name is guaranteed unique. Does that make sense? So within the context of your local repository, you can use the first seven characters, and it's fine. What we can do, though, if you've made a commit, you can add a tag to it, a label, a keyword. So there's my, so my current commit, git tag v0.0.2. That v0.0.2 is the tag name. And that is how you create releases. You simply add a tag to your to your commit and you can retrieve it by tag <coughs> so now you can see I can even add tags to old commits let's imagine there's an old version I want to put a tag onto git tag the 0.0.1 and there's my short commit name and I recommend I advise you to add tags to your commits to make sense of it and when you do your nice graph showing all the commits it puts the tags in that graph so you can see version 1 version 1.1 version 1.2 bug fix yeah and you can see things you can see things far clearer <clears throat> you can even annotate a tag you can add a label to a tag as well so there's my there's my tag there's my 0 0.01 there's my message attached to the tag so i can be quite descriptive in my tag names okay so very very uh, powerful tool there we are so git tag okay there's i'm tagging my current 
code, git status, blah, 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 git commit, final changes, and it will attach that tag to that commit. Okay, and oh, see at the bottom there, see those two commits? There's my old commit, there's my new commit. Git diff, and I put that in, will tell me the differences between those two commits. That's when I said you can have a dot dot syntax. You can list all your tags in your local repository, in your clone, git tag. You can list any tags with messages, okay? You can replace the short commit name with the tag name now. So git show version 0.0.1 .0 will give me, okay, the changes in 0.0.1. This is how people build change, change logs. Think about it, if you're adding tags as you go along, you can extract the tags, filter them, and generate a change log for different versions of your project. You know, you see these change logs where this bug's fixed, this bug's fixed. Did you really think someone sat down there in Microsoft Word and typed up all the changes they made before they, before they uh, released a new version? They simply release the version, filter the tags, and that's called a change log. So if you think about it, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's automatically generated by Git when you create a release. 